Thank you, Mort, and, uh, and thanks again to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so I, I hope to have convinced you by the end that we should do an allotransplant for everybody. But the other question is, is that really the issue? Because in preparation for this talk, I looked at literature and I looked at our own patients. Um, this is a, a slide from uh, a recent paper from the Italians and really uh, patients relapsing. Uh, Bre uh, Brentuximab is a wonderful agent, but the CR rate is not, uh, is far from 100%. Many, many more patients have partial remissions and as time goes on, there's more and more progression. So um, much more commonly we see a different scenario. And I went through our records, uh, I've been two years now at uh, two, one and a half year or so at uh, Cornell and I found four patients that we had an allotransplant for Hodgkin's disease. And as you see the what happens is they all had brentuximab somewhere in their course, but PR, then progressive disease. Uh, ABVD dies, brentuximab, complete remission. Uh, ABVD, progressive disease, dies, GND, gemcitabine, nafobine, doxil, autologous transplant. Both of these patients had autologous transplant, CR, had more brentuximab with progressive disease. So the more common scenario and the last patient ABVD failed to respond, ICE failed to respond, brentuximab failed to respond. So we still don't have the miracle agent for, um, uh, for uh, Hodgkin's disease with a poor prognosis. And where I'm from, where we are always the necessary evil, and the patients come to us when nothing else can be done, with great reluctance. But keep in mind that if we have poor results with transplant, it is perhaps not always the transplant. It is perhaps all that has happened before, in addition to the transplant. And uh, so that's the reality of the patients that I deal with. With that being said, the only patient that would follow this scenario is the second one. So got ABVD, had a complete remission, relapsed, had a, a salvage with dice, had an autologous transplant, relapses again, has brentuximab times nine, and now has a complete remission. So should we go on with brentuximab indefinitely, or should we now do an allo transplant? First, brentuximab. What do we expect with brentuximab? We expect a limited durability, and uh, I will show you also at least a couple of data that this is not totally a benign agent. So again, from the Italians, but in the interest of time, let me skip this one. Let me show you this slide. These are the patients who had a complete remission to brentuximab, and after two years, only about half of them remain in a remission. Keep in mind also several of them don't even have two years of follow-up yet. So do you really want an agent that after getting you in remission has a 50% uh, uh, relapse rate at least? I don't think so. Um, and perhaps if that agent were totally benign, uh, one would continue it without much problems, but this uh, drug res uh, quite commonly causes a taxol-like uh, neuropathy that can be quite debilitating for some patients. It has some pul pulmonary toxicity, although in the setting where we use it here, we rarely see it, but this is more concerning. There's several cases now reported of multifocal look encephalopathy in patients extensively treated with brentuximab. So this is not a totally benign agent to give continuously. Limited efficacy um, and uh, accumulative toxicity. Uh, one could do a second autologous transplant, just one slide about this. That's something we looked at ages ago. Sonali Smith at the University of Chicago went to the IBMPR. We found 21 patients with Hodgkin's. So it's rarely done because it's difficult to do and it's actually not totally benign. Of the 21, 14 had failed. Many of those failures were toxicity. 
So an autologous, second autologous transplant in a heavily pre-treated patient can be done, but it's not so easy either. And uh, patients get more problems with therapy-related myelodysplasia, with delayed engraftment, with opportunistic infections, uh, with organ toxicity, and so forth. So it is not such a great option. Um, allotransplant then. How well does allotransplant work? This is the proof of principle. These are slides provided to me by Carl Peggs from uh, the UK. They probably have the biggest experience. This is a patient who relapsed after an allotransplant and had donor lymphocyte infusion. They have done that repeatedly. They had a 79% overall response rates with lots of durable remissions. And this is an example of somebody over time becoming PET negative after donor lymphocyte infusions. Um, so the proof of principle is there. One can obtain a remission due to graft versus Hodgkin's disease effect. How well does it work in reality? Looking at what the British group did, this is the same group. They compared the outcome of the long-term survival of the patients in their group who had undergone transplant, allotransplant, with those where it was chosen not to do an, uh, not to do an allotransplant. Clearly, survival is superior. Now, this can be criticized because one can question why not a transplant? Perhaps these were the sicker patients and they were not referred for transplant. Perhaps a better study is an Italian, I believe, study where they looked at do patients have a donor? Do patients have an HLA identical sibling or an unrelated donor? And whether or not they go to transplant, the fact of having a donor will lead them to transplant more often but they will be more better balanced groups. And again, a major advantage for allotransplant in progression-free survival and in overall survival. At three months, at three years, 40% are so alive versus 20% alive. Neither of these are superb data, but uh, clearly superior for allotransplant. Now, allotransplant has toxicity, and as I mentioned to you, that may be because we see the patients so late. We see the patients, as I just showed you what I see in my practice after three, four, five uh, prior therapies. What the British have done is use allotransplant as first in the first salvage. They have these relapsing patients, 61 of them. They use the PET, as Dr. Coleman just explained. If they get a nice response to the PET, complete uh, PET negativity, they get an autologous transplant. That's based on data actually from our colleagues at Sloan who showed, Dr. Moskowitz showed that a PET negative is a good predictor for outcome of uh, autologous transplant, but persistent PET positivity is not so good. So if they have less than a CR with the PET, they instead go right away to an allotransplant, related or unrelated. So they incorporate the allotransplant much before they skip the autologous transplant. What happens then is that the patients that go to the autologous transplants are all PET negative and have a superb outcome. The worst patients go to allotransplant and there's only out of, uh, I forget how many there were, but uh, close to 30 or so, there's only one or two or three early failures, 88% long-term survival after an allotransplant. This now goes out to Actually, I have another slide somewhere that I should have brought with me, but this now goes out to seven or eight years. Um, some relapse still, but relatively few, and the relapses are saved by donor lymphocyte infusion. So if we incorporate transplant earlier, allotransplant earlier, without uh, constantly uh, waiting till the patients are deadly ill, uh, our results may improve further. How does this work in the era of brentuximab? There's data from Dr. Chen at um, uh, City of Hope. Patients with um, brentuximab obtaining a response to brentuximab, often partial, partial responses, uh, like in the British experience, underwent transplant, seven match related, eight match unrelated, three haplotransplants, Look at this, none of them die of complications. So allotransplant has moved quite a bit 
uh, they do have chronic rectuses host in this, ex in this experience, which may actually, with slightly different conditioning, be avoided as well. Lastly, um, so I conclude that allotransplant is highly effective, well tolerated if implemented before multiple treatment failures. And I don't have to talk about it, but I, I don't have time to talk about it, but I do think chronic GVHD can be prevented much more effectively. Uh, what happened to our patients? Patient one uh, re, uh, had uh, brentuximab, um, had a CR but progressed during further treatment, then had bendamustine, had another remission, had a core transplant, is now six months post-transplant, no graft versus host disease, uh, no evidence of disease. Patient two had brentuximab, had a partial remission, progressed on treatment, had radiation uh, with a further partial remission, had a match-related donor, is one year post-transplant in remission, no graft versus host disease. Patient three had brentuximab, uh, had a PR, progressive disease, then we combined brentuximab with uh, gemcitabine and navalbine for one cycle, uh, matched the data on 18 months post-transplant. This gentleman has struggled a bit with uh, graft versus host disease, but remains in remission. And the last patient uh, had brentuximab, failed to respond, had gemcitabine oxalic platin, progressed, had bendamustine, had a partial remission. And again, this again shows that you don't need a CR to have good outcomes with uh, allo transplant, had a core transplant, six months post-transplant, and is currently in remission. Of course, short follow-up, but um, it at least shows that transplant can be done quite safely and that we have actually donors for practically everybody in this day and age. Uh, with that, I leave the word to Dr. Yunus. Thank you very much.